Hello and welcome to episode 88 part 2 of Awesome Astronomy for October 2019. We live in angry times. Which is weird, because we've never had it so good. The world has never been so well fed, the world has never been so rich. We have never had such free and easy access to knowledge and our ability to communicate across the globe has never been so easy. Crime has never been so low, violence and war never so rare. But we're unhappy. We are angry. It turns out that deep down humanity loathes its success. In our moment of triumph, as we reap the rewards of centuries of suffering, of backbreaking work, starvation, disease and exploitation, at the very moment when we should be starting to enjoy the fruits of our ancestors' dreams, we seem intent on trying to destroy it all in a fit of pure rage and hate. Politics, rather than being the medium through which we conquer our base instincts and create a consensus that benefits as much and as many as possible, has become the arena of our differences, the place to pour vitriol and scorn on those that dare to have different opinion. We have at our fingertips the knowledge and wisdom of millennia of human thought and experience, and instead we type away to damn, we dehumanise the weak, post hate to those we see as different, we scream like our distant ancestors did at the shadows at the edge of our territory. You would think that we're living in the worst of times rather than the golden age of exploration and science. We laugh at the history books, the ignorance of the past, the ridiculous disputes of kings and princes while we build our walls and burn our coal and refuse to immunise our children. But enough of this. We need something to make us happy. It is time to bathe in all that is wonderful in the world, humanity's exploration of the cosmos. And of course, joining me once more again is Ralph. Aren't stars brilliant? Aren't they? Ah, are that stars? You don't do Northern. <laughs> no, I don't do Northern. No. Have we got out to chat about? I don't actually have not much to chat about, really. Mm. It's only been, like, five minutes since we recorded the last uh, one. Oh, yeah. We should chat about how good that was, or otherwise. Yeah, the last episode was excellent, oh. I thought. And and these, these dry-roasted nuts that I've, I've acquired in the uh, five-minute comfort break between episodes oh. are, are actually rather nice. So this means that we can just spare listeners... The tragedy of us banging on about ourselves and go straight into the news, can we? Hmm. Mm. Yeah, with, with a bit of luck, you'll get away with a short show this month, and especially if there's no Jen as well. Oh, especially. We love you, Jen. Well, as you'd expect, Project Artemis to return humans to the moon is escalating. Brad Pitt talks to astronauts on the ISS about space exploration, because he's in a film about space. And Elon Musk's satellite constellation is causing ire in the Twitterverse, though we'll come on to that in the Q&A segment. So, Paul, do you want to kick us off with your picks in the space exploration news? Okay, so first up, it's goodbye to a veteran. Um, as a few weeks ago saw the last of the Delta IV mediums, a rocket nicknamed the Single Stick that has had a flawless record since it first first flew in 2002. Uh, 22nd of August saw the last four medium take a USAF GPS satellite to orbit. Um, and this really signals the beginning of the end for a space dynasty that goes back to 1957 and the Thor Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile. The rocket launched in August, of course, bears very little resemblance to the Thor and Delta I, but it's been a constant journey of evolution since the 50s, uh, and now we enter the last days of this series of rockets that has had a 95% reliability wow. rate over all that time. I know, isn't that incredible? Since the 50s? Um, yeah. I mean, this is we're talking about you know, Thor. I mean, Thor was a was small nuclear missile mm. um, that um, was... Was I mean the RAF actually used it for a while? Oh right, um, yeah, it was, it was deployed in the UK uh, under RAF control as well. So I imagine it's been sold uh, all around the world then. Yeah, and then Delta what Delta One sort of came from it, and it's sort of the very first Deltas came from this Thor rocket. So is is a Delta Four? Is that a, um, a derivative of the Delta One? In a very long roundabout way, the Delta Four is is the sort of derivative of it, but. It it's it's kind of like um, your your old grandma's broom. It's had six new heads and three new handles. <laughs> um, it's the same broom, but 
but it's it, but it has been this process of evolution in that actually it, it there there is ancestry in there and there's you know there's DNA mm. that runs through and it's 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 gone through this whole process. Um, but ninety five percent reliability over all that time is incredible, isn't it? That's incredible, isn't it? Um, and it's been the workhorse for the space industry. Uh, but now ULA United Launch have five more Delta Four heavies, and that's it. Oh, end of the Delta, the whole the whole Ooh, series of rockets. I missed that. And then we enter the new era of Vulcan Centaur, which is ULA's new launcher. Which will have a reliability rate of 59% rather than 95%. Yeah, <laughs> which will blow up like Ariane 5 did in its first launch. <laughs> um, so actually, it, it's actually quite, quite uh, a, I thought, quite a big story, actually. This was, this mm. was, you know, was it the, is. The end, end of an era. End of an era, exactly. So the next one is a bit of a mixed bag with India's moon mission. Oh, yeah. I know. So like Israel, just months before, our ISRO has found how hard the moon is, both figuratively and literally. <laughs> um, with the failure of the Vikram lander, um, it appears uh, failure occurred about 2.1 kilometers from the, surf, the, the South Polar region surface. Um, and as yet, we don't have confirmation of whether it actually just crashed or did it, it was it landed and but isn't communicating a la Beagle 2? Or is it somewhere in between? Um, those sort of two stalls. But it wasn't all doomed because the orbiter, where most of the science is, uh, Chandrayaan 2, is in successful orbit and will run what will hopefully be a very useful science run from um, 100 kilometres above the moon. Now, I remember when... Um, um, is it Modi, the Indian Prime Minister? Yes when he went over to mission control and he was having to console the um mm. uh, the flight director um he was just inconsolable oh. and and there was so much outpouring of not really venom but kind of schadenfreude almost on on twitter with people saying say you know it's it's embarrassing that he's crying yeah. but you know you think about how much your of your life mm. you put into these missions and how much pride there is for a new country in the um not space race but in in terms of space exploration and you know all the hopes oh. of a nation that are I'm, on you i thought i'm not surprised at all that it was in tears no, and i know you know to borrow borrow that that phrase you know the sort of toxic masculinity this idea mm. that you know men can't show emotion that men can't be so kind of tied up and and, and buy into something so emotionally that you know what they're supposed to do is be really stoic and go oh well you know damn thing you know mm. you know this this guy is probably part of his life's work hmm. and i i know i mean it, christ why not yeah. yeah i mean don't get me wrong if he if he started spontaneously blubbing next to me on the tube i, I wouldn't be too keen on that but um no but you're not under the, the circumstances you're not the president of India with a with an election to to win so i mean well, you, know, you don't that. you don't need to hug him yeah. but um, <laughs> He says cynically, but also just you know why why can't people like that be emotional sometimes? You know, mm. scientists are not automatons. Men, you know, are allowed to be invested in things to the point where actually it does, you know, emotionally break you sometimes. And as we know, bottling up emotions does not help anybody. No, no. And I thought that was great to see that it was someone who really cared about this this working. So yeah. Anyway, away, away from crybabies. What's next? Yeah. I say, last for me is a story that caused all sorts of controversy. Controversy, however you want to say it. <laughs> um, and this was the news, and we, we'll talk a little bit more about this later on, sort of in the QA. But mm. this was the news that ESA announced that it, it moved one of its satellites, the Aeolus Earth Observation Satellite, to reduce the risk of collision with one of SpaceX's Starlink satellites. Yes, one of those sixty craft launched earlier this year to the delight of so many astronomers. <laughs> um, the story is a bit of a torturous one with accusations, counter accusations, fanboys, and rumour bounding around. Um, I had a field day; it was great on Twitter. I know you did. Oh <laughs> man, I was enjoying that. Just just winding up SpaceX fanboys was just brilliant, and they, they you are they, quite the troll, Paul. Oh, I, I I have to say, I put on my troll hat that day because it was hilarious. <laughs> because they take it so friggin' seriously. Tweets from under the bridge. Oh god, it was that day. So you know, I love a good troll hunt, but that day I was the troll. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I was waiting for them. They just they just appeared. It was like it was like that that scene in um uh 
the uh, the Z film, the, the the Brad Pitt zombie movie one. You know, well the zombies make that big column and come up the wall. No. Uh, World War Z. Oh, not seen that. Oh, no, this 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 big all the all the zombies kind of climb on each other like it's, it's thousands of them make this big thing to try and go. And it was like that. The sort of SpaceX fanboys just appeared. <laughs> I'm like <laughs> over. Anyway, it was hilarious. Uh, I had great fun, but. Anyway, getting back back to it, you say without getting down that that particular rabbit hole, it appears that there was a potential conflict between the two craft. So you know that 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 is a given. There were some emails. SpaceX admitted their system of emails and pages. Pages. Who the hell uses a pager? <laughs> I was amazed at this. And they're like, our flight controllers' pages didn't go off. What? It's 2019. Who the hell owns a pager anymore? I know. Oh, really. Um, anyway, their pages didn't alert them. <laughs> ESA gave some ground that the risk wasn't as bad as all that, though a United States Air Force report suggested it perhaps was as bad as all that. Um, and of course, lots of fanboys pointed to ESA and its attempt to push its satellite collision avoidance project for funding. Mm-hmm. So that it was it was convenient. As ever, the real story got lost, and that is that this is this sort of story of, of satellites coming to proximity is going to be a more common occurrence. Um, especially with the birth of these mega constellations, and there will probably has to be a bit more discussion about the realities, rules, and regulations of what is now, uh, well, up until now, has been a bit of a free for all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no one owns space, but the reality is that while a system um, of a few sort of space launching nations coordinating like a sort of gentleman's club having a game of bridge worked well in the past. We have so many more players and vast numbers of especially small satellites now. It, it's this is going to end in failure at some point. Yeah, and so I think I think this is a problem. That 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 was half the problem. As you know, sort of lots of people on Twitter essentially this sort of libertarian view of oh, it's you know it's, it's a free for it should be nobody should regulate this. This is anybody can launch it. It's like no, that that's going to end in disaster. In the same way that airspace has to be regulated, anyone can get a plane, anyone can learn to fly and fly their plane, but you have to kind of follow rules and regulations to keep everybody mm. safe. Yeah, we've got we've got five thousand satellites up there currently. Yeah, there's twelve thousand in Starlink. I think Amazon are planning on doing one. Other people will want to do them. Yeah, you know, you're going to be looking at six, maybe even ten times as many satellites in orbit in in a couple of decades. And yeah, yeah. we're going to have to make this a bit less of a gentleman's club and some people will have to say okay we take priority now whether that's down to science or whether it's because you've got yeah. the most space assets up there i don't know but um there's gonna have to be some kind mm. of priority over this so of course there is. as there is i mean um the, there is in in sort of airspace about you know sort of yeah. the priorities of aircraft and where they fly and which aircraft get priority over others and um that that's just gonna have to be agreed i mean you know the air system took to, to decades to kind of put together and agree and but it's a good precedent but it, but it, exactly um, and the same with shipping you know shipping there's a whole series of rules you know, anyone could go out on a ship but there are a series of rules you know the laws of the sea that you have to follow to basically to stop people hitting each other <laughs> <laughs> basically you know and that's um, I th- we're just going to have to eventually get to that point in space it's, mm. uh, it's going to be a friggin disaster anyway Ralph your turn Right, so my first pick is the award of funding by NASA to the company Advanced Space. Um, This is to develop and operate a CubeSat mission that will go and sit in the unusual orbit that the Lunar Gateway will occupy. Mm. So the Lunar Gateway is that mini space station that NASA's planning for a highly elliptical orbit around the moon as a staging post for robotic and human moon landings. Now, the Pathfinder, known as Capstone, could launch as early as December next year to de-risk the ultimate lunar satellite and shows how much effort is going into Project Artemis and the diversity of outsourced commercial assistance being funded. It's really ex- it's really exciting. I mean, there's always talk about the Gateway being cancelled, but I really hope it isn't. Well, that's the, that's the bit that I think is the most expendable. I think everybody thinks that's the bit that's the most expendable. Hmm. But NASA, you know, even though the SLS is almost done, the, the massive moon rocket, the Orion is completed, um, there's a lunar lander by Blue Origin now, um, and the lunar gateway is the bit that hasn't been done, but NASA are still chasing that one down. They're doing all the pathfinding stuff. They are going great guns at this. Oh, and actually, I 
think, yes, every single one of my news stories is around Project Artemis. There is that much. <laughs> so if, if you're a returning to the moon and heading out to Mars freak, then I think <laughs> I'll be surprised if it's not every month that I'm covering at least mm. something from Project Artemis because it is going like gangbusters. Yeah. Uh, so next up is the $150 million that the Australian Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, has committed to this endeavour too. The Australians, if you remember, were really heavily involved in America's uh, Apollo programme in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, so it's really nice to see them also getting involved in the next lunar adventure. Uh, the contributions are expected to be in the key areas of robotics, automation and remote asset management, uh, which is actually similar to those that are currently being used by Australia in mining operations. Uh, so it's a it's a nice, neat lift and shift of capabilities from one sector, one tech sector, into another tech sector. And with the Australian Space Agency being formed only last year, they're now cementing themselves at the forefront of deep space human exploration. So <laughs> way to go, Australia. I think that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Though you've got, <laughs> it's like the UK Space Agency that... You know, it's, it's been it's been pottering around with small satellites and and licensing satellites into space and things for yeah. the last little while. Maybe a little launch pad somewhere. Australia gets there, there and go right. Yeah, we're going yeah. to the moon. We're going to the moon with the Americans. Yeah, we're just 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 go. Well, I think that's because the Australian Space Agency is a space agency, whereas the UK Space Agency is a funding council mm. um, and a, a bureaucracy. It's not. I wouldn't say it's remotely a space agency. No, there, there is an argument that actually, because it is essentially almost like a, an office within a, a law, a, a ministry, isn't it? Yeah, it, I it, mean, it's no, it's no surprise that it's located with all the rest of the research councils that that fund science. It's yeah. it's largely, a, I mean, I suppose it is a section of um, business, enterprise, industry, and skills, or whatever they're called. It's it's largely about boosting uh um british industry in space isn't it yes yeah, it it's about you know providing the 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 way and the expertise for satellites and building that satellite market rather than you know actually being an active space exploration mm. agency yeah absolutely. Anyway, anyway that's my rant <laughs> <laughs> And I agree. But at the same time as the um, Australian announcement, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine was heading to Japan to meet his JAXA counterpart, uh, where the agency leaders shared their intention to seek support and commitment from their stakeholders in the United States and Japan to document proposals and to conclude the necessary arrangements between their respective agencies and governments. Vague. Vague, vague. So mm -hmm. there's no concrete JAXA commitment, but it is thought that they're likely to contribute with a Japanese habitation module for the gateway and logistics using the HTVX vehicle, which is an advanced version of the H2 transfer vehicle. Oh, that's a good vehicle. It's currently being used. Hmm? It's a good vehicle. Yeah, so that's, that's the one that they that they use to deliver cargo to the mm. International Space Station. So they've, they've got components that they can uh, add to Project Artemis and that will be useful, but at the moment there's no actual commitment. But when JAXA do things, a bit like ESA, when JAXA do things, they do things properly. Mm. And in a declaration of intent, as well as a critical step forward in Project Artemis, NASA have placed an initial order of three Orion spacecraft for $2.7 billion for the first three crewed moon landings, Artemis 3, Artemis 4, and oh, Artemis 5. They're just so exciting. They're, 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 they've they've got the, the names. I know. It's like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Then they plan to buy three more Orion spacecraft for Artemis 6, 7, and 8 in uh, 2022 for $1.9 billion, with the option for up to six more Orion spacecraft being oh. bought all the way through to September 2030. It just, oh, I know. It's happening. It's know. happening. It's happening. It's <laughs> happening. I, it's very exciting, isn't it? I know. And Orion is the now completed capsule that's being built by Lockheed Martin and the service module being built by Airbus in Europe. Mm. And it'll, it'll sit on top of NASA's moon rocket, the Space Launch System. Now, unlike the Apollo capsule, Orion will take four astronauts to the moon and are also designed to be reusable, unless that's changed. But um, I think it's still a reusable capsule. So yeah. six or twelve Orion capsules are making quite the commitment to continued lunar and deep space exploration if they can be used more than once. Well, this is, this is what I was really interested in that they've ordered so many. Yeah, you know, they're, they're potentially ordering. Why not up to, test them being reused? No, they're they're, they're you know, potentially up ordering up to twelve of these things. 
Yeah. Which um, if they can be used only three times, then yeah, you know that's that's thirty six missions potentially. Yeah, exactly. This is this is really interesting because I wonder how how reuse. I've, I've not actually looked into it of late. Like how reusable Orion is because mm. it was always stated it was it was going to be a sort of you know a space shuttle capsule essentially in terms of it's like kind of you could keep reusing the the thing. But it's fascinating. They've ordered you know up to twelve of them. That's a huge commitment. But yeah, it's very exciting. And then are we going to be talking about Artemis three being? That mission, mm. you know, when we talk about Apollo eleven, it'd be Apollo eleven, it'd be Artemis three. So exciting! Oh, it is I can't wait, can't wait, and we're, we're, it's not long. It is not. So if they're talking the first what twenty twenty one for Artemis one to mm. go around the moon uncrewed with a whole load of cameras, and I think they're taking cubesats up, aren't they? About yeah. ten experiments on cubesats. Two was. Are they talking about... 20, it was 22, or they moved it to 23 now? For their first... Crude. Human-sized lunar. Yeah, for, for basically, essentially, what's going to be Apollo 8. Yeah. Is, is, is Artemis 2, isn't it? Yes. And Artemis 3 will be the first lunar landing, so analogous to Apollo 11. But yeah. presumably all four astronauts will go to the surface with an automated service module. I don't know. I don't know. I don't or, know. Or will it be three to the surface and one up? You wouldn't want to be that guy when you when it is automated, or it could be automated. <laughs> could be. Yeah, yeah, but you wouldn't be. Well, you wouldn't want to be that guy on the ground when you, when you could have been sat there going, "Well, if only I'd have been up in this shuttle, mm-hmm. I'd have been all right." <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't particularly eloquent, was it? When you're on the surface of the moon in that tin can, going, "Can you hear air escaping somewhere?" <laughs> Can somebody just push a pencil in the back of the reset button on the... Oh. <laughs> so, for the main story this month, uh, we're going to turn our attention to everyone's favourite Marmite evil genius, Elon Musk, and the advances <laughs> being made by SpaceX. So, Paul, what's the little tinker been up to recently? Well, this is the... In a way, uh, I don't think... Anyone quite knows what exactly is going on. <laughs> but it's being done at pace. But it's being done at pace. So we've got multiple spaceships being built. So we've got... He, he basically announced a, a few months ago that, that, that to get things moving, to try and innovate and things, he basically set up an internal competition to build the same spacecraft but in two different places. So he's got two teams mm. competing to build the Starship. It makes sense. Yeah, which is which is incredible. So I mean, it, you know, it shows the sort of the kind of level of thinking of this this, this company. There's all these sorts of amazing things. They went, do you know what? How are we going to innovate? Let's innovate within ourselves. Let's actually have two different two different places across America building essentially the same spacecraft and and, and see what happens. Um, and they're coming together. And then in the meantime, we've then got Starhopper. Yeah. Which is an which is the sort of test rig for both of these starship platforms and this is all kind of now spacex are annoying the hell out of me with different names for different components as well as developing different things individually so i'm really losing track of of what hardware is is Mm. what with all these different names but essentially this is all components that will come together to be I think it's called Starship, what used to be um, the old BFR or Big Falcon rocket. So this is that that yeah. big platform that's got a, that's like bigger than the Saturn V, uh, able to take off and land in the same configuration, but also has a giant capsule at the front that can hold up to a hundred people to take them to colonize Mars. Which sounds mad, but but watch the videos. It's it's quite impressive if he manages to pull it off. Oh, I've got, but, I mean. So the Starhopper test mm. was incredible. It was. I mean, that's that's kind of like a small prototype version of that top segment, isn't it? Yeah. That, that will eventually carry and the hundred people. What 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 was amazing was this you know it's this big four legged thing which is huge. I mean, it's a big thing, mm. and it it jumped up in the air and flew across to the other pad on one engine. Yeah. That's what. It was only 250 metres away, and I think it did an altitude of 500 metres, but that's not the point. It's this giant... Giant thing. Giant... For, yeah. Well, mostly filled with fuel, so, you know, a lot of weight yeah. there on a single Raptor engine. 
and it was perfectly stable, perfectly yeah, the successful. whole way through, and it was it was just stunning to watch. It I was. mean, you just brilliant. This and is the sort of thing that we would have been saying a few years ago will never happen. Yeah, exactly. As we've said before, he's he's made he certainly made me eat my words mm. in the past. Um, and yeah, and so this is this is the sort of data that's then feeding into the these starships that are being built in two places, and the the recent announcements is that you know this is all, this is going on a pace, and and that we're looking at sort of bigger and bigger tests. You know, the next next test was uh, I think it's using three Raptor engines, isn't it? Mm. And then we're going to get to sort of suborbital tests, so you know, yeah. getting into space, but you know coming down again. That's early next year yep and then by the the end of the year we're looking at full orbital tests that's the end of next year yeah yeah and that's using three raptor engines on those but yeah i mean and what what i'm kind of liking in the the sort of you know the and this is as i've always said he's got this eye to the science fiction he 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 like musk's clearly a massive fan of science fiction yeah the way he's building these things out in the open in a field is like building ships. <laughs> it's not the way exposing them to the elements. I think we've said this on on the show before mm. that there's no way that he's actually building a rocket out there in Boca Chica in Texas because you don't build rockets outside because it's exposed to all the elements. But it turns out he actually is. He actually is. <laughs> we we had that discussion months ago, didn't we? We said like, ah, yeah, surely this is this is nonsense. This is not. But not with giant steel bulkheads like ships. This is like flimsy aluminium because it has to be as light as possible. Yeah. But he's building. He's basically they're like shipyards. <laughs> yeah. It's like those scenes in in Star Trek, you know, where you see the Enterprise being built in a big shipyard. And that's probably his inspiration as well. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. That's exactly what I mean. He's clearly such a massive science fiction fan that yeah. that he's he's gone, do you know what? Let's do it like that. And he's building these bloody great rockets out yeah. in the open in essentially shipyards. Yeah. In the same way that we built ships in the well, still do. Um and and it it kind of astounds me and and also I think it's quite amazing. <laughs> so and and the fact that these things, these these remarkable silver things that are sort of popping up, are going to be in orbit this time next year. God, yeah, is just and the the reentry. There was an announcement just just the other day about how this um, the reentry is going to work really weird. It's for the the, the how it's it's going to kind of surf in and and do this sort of belly flop through the atmosphere. Before it sort of lands on its tail, um, yeah, because it's a, it's a, it's kind of a bit like a stumpy shuttle shape on one yeah. side, isn't it? Yeah, and 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 it's going to be amazing to see like how the, this this whole just whole new way of doing it basically. It's, yeah, it's going to be really interesting. And the failure failure rate to date is really low as well. Mm. Now it's going to obviously get a lot more complex and heavier, and there'll be more systems and subsystems that could go wrong. But to date. Really low failure rate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm simultaneously a sort of really like what SpaceX does, but I'm not a fanboy. <laughs> well, that's the that's the normal approach, isn't it? Exactly. It's like I yeah. like what you do. It's really, but so there's a little bit the, the kind of more anarchic side of me is going. I'm waiting for the for the failure. Yeah. I'm waiting for something to really screw up because it. Yeah. You, you just like surely it can't there be this. Has to be something. You can't, can't be this ambitious. No, exactly. Doing this kind of scale of stuff and being this lucky, surely the luck's going to run out at some point. Yeah, but, but so I do so, hope not. No, but and say, but also simultaneously, I think oh, I hope it all works brilliantly. Yeah, and because they've got so many components that are part of this, and of course all the the parts of the reusable parts of the Falcon rockets, um, which eventually I think Elon Musk is talking about retiring because the BFR will be able to do everything, or yeah. S- um, Starship will be able to do everything. But there's so many different components now that if you add that to the um, Blue Moon that Blue Origin, that the 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 lunar lander that Blue Origin have already come out mm. and said is is there now, and you've got Dream Chaser almost like a, a space shuttle alongside all the NASA hardware now. There's so many components now oh. that could be used by NASA as part yeah. of Project Artemis. You know, they can just pick and choose. It, it's all, you realise, I think, it, 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 by by the end of the decade, no, next decade, 2019, we're, we're practically in the next decade. Yeah. 
that that we're going to be in a very different environment in terms of of kind of how space works and how we get there and where we're going and what craft are being used it is is going to be a very different environment yeah yeah it, there's going to be all these large rockets from different organizations in different countries it's just going to be incredible mm. um, it, it's, it's that feast or famine thing we, we've gone from like the soyuz <laughs> and some some old like like we were talking about earlier 60s you know, hardware Del, delta four and things that suddenly yeah. we're, we're talking about stuff that's built like a shipyard and is this kind of you know i think almost can treated like ships yeah you know taking vast amounts of kit and people into space it's just incredible well, we have earned it. I mean, we have gone through a real famine in mm. our lifetimes. Um, nothing with the excitement of uh, of moon landings and reaching out. It's all been suborbital stuff. Now, the shuttle was an amazing feat of engineering, mm. um, as is the International Space Station, but they're just not glory and they're not reaching out into the further frontiers that we were all promised since um, yeah. since Apollo. You know, where's where's my damn hoverboard? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, where are my self-tying trainers? And, exactly. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, completely. Order, order. Court is in session. I see we have two space programs on today's docket. Mr. Hill, you'll be representing your client, the uh, ISS? Uh, That's the International Space Station, if you please, my lord. Obliged. And uh, Mr. Wilkins, you'll be representing your client, the Pioneer Program. I will, my lord. Very well. Mr. Hill, please proceed with your opening statement in defence of the International Space Station. My lord, thank you. Um, The International Space Station. The International Space Station is one of humanity's greatest achievements. I say this because it isn't Apollo which might sound like a ridiculous statement. But what I mean is that this is the longest human-based mission ever. We look at Apollo, we look at the moon landings, and rightly they are considered one of the greatest achievements of humanity. But they were short-term. They were missions designed to achieve the goal of putting someone on the moon and returning them to Earth. The International Space Station has provided us with the longest human presence in space. There has been there have been humans living in space since November 2000. There have been continuous human presence in Earth orbit for almost 19 years. The figures of what the ISS is and how it was put together are beyond the scope of most space missions. It cost $150 billion. There are, right now, 23 space centres around the globe directly involved in this mission. There have been 236 astronauts visiting the space station from 18 different countries. When we put the treaty together in 1988, no one could have conceived of the breadth and depth that this space station would provide in terms of international relations and the science and the output. This space station weighs 419,000 kilograms. It is the largest human object in space. It took almost 100 rocket launches to put it into space. It took 159 spacewalks to put together and took over a thousand hours of EVA. This space station has taught us how to build and how to live in space. Apollo. Apollo was a weekend away. The ISS has shown us how we can get back to the moon and how we can get to Mars and live in space for the long term. The science output has been dramatic. If you go to an NHS hospital now with a head injury, they will test the pressure in your brain to see if you are suffering a brain bleed and if if your, your brain is crushing itself inside your skull. The instrument they will be using 
was tested on the ISS. So not only has this space station taught us how to live in space, not only does this space station provide us with the longest human presence in space, not only has it provided the greatest experience in EVA and space construction, all the skills we need to get to other worlds, it is also saving lives on Earth right now. This space station can hold up to nine people. It has an acre of solar panels, the largest solar panels ever constructed. It can dock simultaneously six spacecraft. This space station has taught us more about space, more about spacecraft, more about the endurance of humanity than any other space mission in history. It gets overlooked because it's not landing on the moon. It's not flying a spacecraft around Jupiter. It's sitting in Earth orbit. It's just 250 miles above our head. But the achievement of the ISS is to allow humanity to expand off of the surface of the Earth and to live in space and go beyond our home. And that is why the ISS is one of humanity's greatest achievements and should be celebrated as one of our greatest missions. I thank you. Thank you for that uh, impassioned speech, Mr. Hill. Mr. Wilkins. Oblige, my lord. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the Pioneer programme was so impressive that it proved the ground for many of the capabilities, systems and manoeuvres that every orbital and deep space spacecraft rely on today. Before an integrated circuit or a modem was ever invented, they proved the way for lunar flybys, lunar orbiters, Venus orbiters and descent probes. Not with Gemini or Apollo technology, that was developed from pioneer engineering and lessons learnt. To put it into stock perspective, the earliest pioneer missions were attempts to achieve Earth's escape velocity simply to show it was feasible, and then to study the Moon and Venus. Pioneer was the first of NASA's space programmes. So early was this programme that it began under the control of NASA's predecessor, the NACA. The first Pioneer mission was launched in 1958. The designs and technology development began in the early 1950s, less than 10 years after World War II. Impressive as this is, the world knows Pioneer because of Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11, which built on the earlier Pioneer missions to reach further into the solar system than was even thought possible. Both contain magnetometers to study magnetic fields and solar wind interactions, plasma analyzers to analyze the solar wind, charged particle instruments for cosmic ray detection, a cosmic ray telescope, a Geiger tube telescope, radiation detectors, meteoroid detectors, asteroid detectors, helium and hydrogen detectors, imaging photopolarimeters and infrared radiometers. These don't sound like they're just going to test the conditions in space or drop probes into Venus. They weren't. Pioneer 10 was the first spacecraft to traverse the asteroid belt. It performed the first flyby of Jupiter and revealed the storms, huge magnetic fields and radiation, and images of Io, Callisto, Ganymede and Europa. Then it proved the concept of a slingshot to fling itself out of the solar system. Pioneer 11 also visited Jupiter, detailed the Great Red Spot, took our first data of the polar regions, measured the mass of Callisto for fun then used a slingshot manoeuvre to perform the first ever flyby of Saturn. There it was prepared to be sacrificed by examining the hazardous ring plane so the voyagers wouldn't have to. It discovered moons, nearly crashed into Epimetheus, charted Saturn's magnetosphere and magnetic field, found its planet-sized moon Titan was too cold for life and sent back the first close-up pictures of Saturn's rings and the ring dynamics. Our first data from the asteroid belt, or either of the gas giants, was from Pioneer. Our first close-up images of Jupiter and Saturn were from Pioneer, and they did it in normal colour, infrared and ultraviolet, because they could. Pretty much the work of Voyager five years before Voyager. In a sense, true Pioneers. Pioneer 10 and 11 actually looked remarkably like Voyager, because Voyager 1 and 2 were Pioneer spacecraft with more modern instruments and a fortuitous planetary alignment. The name change was a PR move to look like a whole new modern programme and get the missions funded, but in reality, they were actually Pioneer 12 and 13. Without Pioneer, 
there will be no Mercury, Gemini, Apollo or Voyager, and the advances they created propelled technology 20 or 30 years ahead of where we had any right to be. If Apollo missed its 1960s time slot, would the political will still be there? Without the pioneers, we'd probably have cancelled the first moon landings because of the 2008 financial crisis, and the money sink that is the International Space Station would just be getting congressional approval to start in five or ten years' time. We'd have computers with a megabyte memory, TVs would be 20 inches with newfangled remote controls, and our phones would still be firmly landline now. Pioneer 10 and 11 are two of only five spacecraft that have the escape velocity to leave the solar system. Pioneer 10 will continue in the direction of Aldebaran, and Pioneer 11 will continue towards Messier 26, both with the first gold disks that Carl Sagan added to a spacecraft. Thank you, Mr Wilkins. I must say that after Mr Hill's testimony, I was uh, already leaning towards the ISS. Clearly, the uh, International Space Station has provided a great deal to the knowledge of uh, humankind, allowing our human pioneers to go forward and uh, make great discoveries to advance science and advance space exploration. However, Mr. Wilkins has, has made an extremely strong case for the pioneer missions. I think, on the whole, pioneer has has enabled much of what has gone before, much in the same way as early scientists have enabled modern day scientists to stand on their shoulders and go forth making uh, more and more discoveries. Without the Pioneer program, none of that would have been possible and we would be much worse off for it. So it is the decision of this court that the Pioneer program is the better of the two programs. I, I think that's the right decision after those arguments. Me too. Of course it is. I'm the judge. Yeah. <laughs> Court is adjourned. Pictures. Okay, so our question this month comes from our good friend Noah Krauss in Bremen, Germany, who tweeted us amid the recent social media storm when the European Space Agency performed a collision avoidance manoeuvre to protect one of its satellites from colliding with a SpaceX satellite. Noah asked, now that ESA have had to change the course of a satellite just weeks after the launch of the first of SpaceX's communications satellite, does this mean more satellite collisions in the future? And I guess we kind of touched on this a little earlier on in the news section. We but did. to add a little bit more flesh to the bones, um, what's your thoughts on that, Paul? Um, yes. <laughs> Essentially, yes. I mean, the, the, it, it, it's the um, you put more stuff into a volume, it, it, you're increasing the risk of collision. Statistically. Yeah. And. Yes, there are certain measure controls and 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 abilities to to move these, but I there will be a, an inevitable in the same way that aircraft collide. Even though it is rare and it doesn't happen very often, but they do collide, given all the volume of air that's available and all all the you know possible heights and and places you can go in an aircraft. Aircraft still still meet in the sky. <laughs> You know, and this is with, you know, air traffic control actually controlling them, and a, a human pilot sitting in the front of them actually making them work. We're talking about satellites. Yeah, my my answer to this is that, so not necessarily will the spacecraft collide more. Um, I mean, we've not had satellites collided in the past to date with 5,000 up there and a lot more debris. I think there's something like 40,000 yeah. pieces of debris up there. Um, the only collisions that there have been in space are ones that are deliberate with like a Gina and Apollo spacecraft or with the uh, Chinese testing that they can blow satellites out mm -hmm. of the sky mm -hmm. with rockets. However, statistically, yes, like, like you say, I think the more spacecraft there are, the more chance there is of a collision. It just stands to reason the more congested the space is. Just because the more stuff in space means there's a higher risk of them colliding. But uh, what I would also say is the maps of space debris that you see are incredibly misleading. I oh, mean, space please. is absolutely massive. And when you see 
a diagram, you always see the globe of the Earth, and then you see this kind of shell yeah. around it. Yeah, yeah. Where where each of the dots in there, which if they were to ratio, would be the size of Belgium. And of course, all the spacecraft that are there aren't. Space is huge. It's the 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 chances of collision are so small um, because the, the this shell of low Earth orbit and even more so yeah. with geosynchronous orbit higher up is much. <laughs> it's a much bigger space than it is much lower down in the Earth's atmosphere when you've got thousands of planes every single day that are crisscrossing the globe. It and is. also, there's a little-known fail-safe that's run by the 18th Space Control Squadron in the United States Air Force, which is called the Space Situational Awareness Sharing Program, or the SSA. And this provides a spaceflight safety data exchange between anyone who wants to sign up to this service. Now, of course, if you maintain an expensive satellite... You'll want to use this service, and of course, the European Space Agency and SpaceX do, which means that they get notification of a possible collision seven days in advance. So there will likely be more collision courses as more satellites are launched, and we're going to go from 5,000 satellites to 18, uh, no, 17,000 satellites if Starlink um, SpaceX's constellation comes online. But they're all being tracked, and possible collisions are being automatically sent to satellite operators, meaning that they're very unlikely to collide. And, of course, we were mentioning earlier about pages and messages being sent, but that's between the two companies. There was also messages that were being sent. I think it was up to 32 diff- individual messages that were sent out by the 18th Space Control Squadron mm. to ESA in advance. So I think there was... There was um, as, as you mentioned, Paul, I think there was a little bit of showing that there needs to be more... Uh, a, a European equivalent to this that, that ESA want to get funding for. But then also, the 18th um, Space Control Squadron want to get better resolution on this as well. So they're looking for congressional funding so, so that they can track images that are even smaller as well because even you know sub-centimetre pieces of debris up there, while they may not be disastrous... Well, they could be disastrous. You know, they could knock out systems on spacecraft. Mm-hmm. They could hit antennas. They could hit um, um, sensors... They just want to be able to get this greater resolution. So th- there's a lot of politics involved in this as well. Yeah, and I, I think I think my feeling is that um, it, it's going to be a very, very complex environment. It already is a very complex environment. And two satellites essentially in the same orbit do not necessarily behave in exactly the same way. Mm. Especially in the low Earth orbit where you're, you're essentially you're skimming the, the, the higher reaches of Earth's atmosphere. And so different craft behave in different way and orbits degrade in different ways and it's assuming that all satellites are that controllable which many of them are many of them aren't though and of course all the satellites as they they you know, lose reaction wheels and things like that and lose lose fuel aren't as controllable as 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 a new satellite mm. so this is a very complex environment mm. uh, and it is actually essentially still a free for all yeah, you know anybody can launch a satellite. Basically, it's not as simple as that. In, in you know, if you're sitting in the UK or the USA, you can't just build a rocket and launch a satellite. But any country can, and, and it's ungoverned. And it's ungoverned, exactly. And so, it's all very well saying you know, that there is a, a a system set up to kind of monitor it, but it's it's voluntary. Not everyone has to sign up for this. Yeah. Um. No, I think and, they will just because they want to protect their assets and that's the oh, best way of doing it. So. It's essentially outsourced. You just pay someone yeah. to do it for you rather than setting up your own space monitoring system. However, at the moment you can do it as a gentleman's club because there are so few mm. relative but, to the to the volume of space there. But it's, it's increasing, so few yeah. satellites there. It's increasing all the time. And the, the problem you've got is failure. Because that was one of the issues with this SpaceX ESA thing. That there was a, there was some questions at the time of whether this was one of the satellites they were deliberately uh, bringing down to, to test um, part of the system, or whether this actually was a failed one. And of course, the, the larger number of satellites you have in orbit, the greater the number of failures there will be. And once you have you know, a failed satellite falling through the system, mm. um, it, it's just... It's... It's it's not necessarily going to be a common thing, but it's going to happen in the same way that aircraft do collide and ships collide. I mean, look at how big the flipping ocean is and how small ships are. They still collide right in the middle of the ocean. And the idea that you know, there'll never be a satellite that will, that will 
the will collide with another. It's going to happen. Yeah, it, it will have to. It, it's just with the thousands and thousands of satellites that are about to be put up. It, it will happen. There will be. I, one... I think it, it will only happen. I think if um, people either don't sign up to that service, which is their own foolishness, because they with the expense of the the space assets they really should do or if the, the spacecraft are unable to alter course for some reason whether it's a telemetry yeah. thing whether it's a guidance thing or whether and it's run out of both run out of fuel yeah and that the thing is that that's going to happen at some point you know the satellite all these satellites aren't just going to automatically deorbit the moment they're out of fuel or, or become defunct so the number of satellites you're going to put up means you're going to end up with a greater number of dead satellites that are uncontrollable in space. And eventually you're just going to reach a point where there, there will be. Yeah, those pictures of, of Earth with the debris, are, they're completely misleading. It's nothing like that. Space is vast and, and yeah. Earth orbit is huge. But you put things into similar orbits. It's not like we're spreading them out evenly necessarily. And the most, the majority of assets are in low Earth orbit in that band. Yeah, um, you know, there's no, there's the, the sorts of orbits you're looking for the, to, to do similar tasks it means there are a lot of satellites ending up in in similar areas and in similar orbits. Hmm. Uh, it, it's, I think, I think it's something we mustn't necessarily. I think you know, films like Gravity, for instance, you know, sort of put the fear of God into people. <laughs> you know, this is, and it's, it, I don't think people should think like that remotely. But I think we should also expect that there will be incidents. You know, the, the ISS has to get moved out of the way all the time of stuff. You would think that would take precedence, wouldn't you? That, yeah. <laughs> that other things would have to be moved for that. <laughs> yeah, but the ISS is constantly having to be to be shifted. Yeah. Mostly because of debris that's there. Because of debris and things like that, which mm. means it's, you know, it's there. It's going to happen. Mm. It's going to happen at some point. So, yeah, statistically, it's more likely, but I don't think it's going to be something that happens every week. Yeah. And I just want to give a thanks to uh, Lauren Grush of The Verge website and Dustin Roof from the Galaxy Rise podcast for their investigations and sharing of info from the 18th Space Control mm. Squadron because I wasn't aware of that. So that was good to know that there is that kind of backstop there. Thanks, guys. Cool. Well, you've been patient, you've listened intently and haven't interrupted, so here's your well-deserved reward. We'll shut up and let you get back to impeachment, international corruption, unlawful parliaments and climate denial. You're a strange species. But that's all for this month. We'll be back on the 1st of November with our first offering of each month, our astronomy-based show. And if you want to get in touch, you can find us on Twitter at AwesomeAstroPod. And you can get hold of the show by email at the show at awesomeastronomy.com. And I would urge you to do that. Get in touch with us. We kind of like you. Oh. So until next time, it's goodbye from Sidonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John, and Damien, and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science, and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions, or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod, or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Sidonia Base, end of transmission. <laughs>